places to stand, microphones moving in and out of place. Marty, I was kind of taken when you said to the congregation, one of these two verses is familiar, not the second. And I'm glad to see how the Spirit of God enabled right now to include that second verse, the 17th verse. The children's worker, Lydia, where is she? She's already gone. And then she picked up on the word so. One thing that I've noticed over the year of this pandemic is when I watch different sporting events, usually you would see in the stands, even at college games, somebody holding up a sign with John 3.16. Maybe my eyesight's getting bad, Bobby, but I didn't see it this year. I watched all the races yesterday up in Kentucky and I saw some wonderful hats, but I didn't see anybody holding up a sign saying John 3.16. But then I came here to Ringgold today at nine o'clock. I see a congregation of people that have not forgotten what it means to so love. Seeing it on video to Haiti, seeing it on your faces. And Bobby, I like the way you all have those connection groups, but don't take this as a negative, but I was beginning to look places that I can go and continue to learn and run and have fun. And when I saw all the different ways you could give, I know this part is true. Probably, if I would guess, Marty, 50% of this congregation is involved in ministry during the week and not just on Sunday. And not just on special times in the life of the church. For truly they are disciples of Jesus Christ 24 hours a day. And as reminded by Lydia in our baptismal vows and confirmation, we don't do it in our own strength. We do it in the strength of God Almighty and for his honor and glory. John 3.16 is often quoted. And I think Jesus, and I wanted to think that John, the writer of the gospel, want to make it very plain. The important part of the whole scriptures, in my opinion, is for God so loved the world. What kind of so loved the world did God have? Did he have the kind of love that if you do something for me, I'll do something for you? Or was it a different kind of love? For God so loved the world, whose world did he love? We know that he was sent to the lost children of Israel. Is that the only world that Jesus came to? Some would think, since the prophets of old foretold that a Messiah was to come, even told where, didn't say when. Don't you think those people were really confused when Jesus started speaking to a woman? who had been married many times at the well? What about the rich young ruler that came to him at night? What about Zacchaeus up in a tree? For God so loved the world in which he made. But didn't he destroy that world? Didn't he send a mighty flood? But then he put a rainbow in the sky to remind him that no matter how bad humankind got, he would not just annihilate the world. For God so loved the world. Do we love the world that God so loved? Or do we only love bits and pieces of that world that love us back? 
I'm glad to see a church that makes all God's people created in his image welcome in a place like this. For those of you that are watching not in person, may I encourage you when you feel you're able to come to a place where they're trying real hard to so love the world that God gave. He gave his only begotten son. And Lydia, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's the example that Jesus is showing you and I. That sacrificial love of willing to lay down your life for another. Not for a cause, but for a person whose name is Jesus Christ because he laid his life down for you. I really believe if you were the only one, and no matter how unworthy you may feel, no matter what you may have done, for God so loved you that he gave you his only begotten son. And you noticed what a family has done with the loss of a loved one this weekend. They've come to be part of that love. For in these times we are reminded that God is with us. Because God knows the hurt and pain that this family is going through now. For God so loved the world, Lydia, that he stretched out his hands to die upon a cross. And isn't it interesting that on one side of him was a criminal? I wonder what the SPR committee would think if the preacher hung around criminals. Hmm? But you notice in Jesus' last moment on life, a man who was convicted by the Romans, put to death. Jesus told him, as we will see in the next verse, you're with me today in paradise. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. This belief is more than head knowledge about things you learn at confirmation. This believing stuff is about trust. Do you trust Jesus with everything? We've been challenge this year haven't we and we're still not over it yet but if God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that God didn't send Jesus down here like you send your kids off to camp or to church but rather he gave Jesus to the world so that we would not have fear of anything but that we would have life eternal both now and forevermore. For some of you that during this pandemic, it was just you, especially for the our times of quarantine. I happened to be one of those people. I wasn't able to see my grandkids at Thanksgiving or Christmas and mainly at Christmas time, I said, well, let's just go take one of those things called a COVID test and I'm feeling pretty good. Only to be called on Sunday morning and said, John, you've tested positive. And like you, I'd already been reading about all the symptoms and I didn't feel like I had any symptoms. And my son said, why did you decide to take the test? You, if you hadn't taken the test, you could have come down here. And I said, well, who knows? <laughs> I was one of these kind of people that tested positive, but 
the only symptoms I had was a headache. And I thought it was all because of the stress I was under in the job. And yes, like you, I trusted not only God, but I trusted in the scientists of our country. And when I was able to get the first COVID shot, I did, and then the second. I don't know if I have to get a third or a fourth, who knows? <laughs> But I'm not going to grow, get discouraged because I know and trust that God is guiding and directing a lot of people, not just here in this country, but even today, the way the world is reaching out to the people of India. God sent his son not to condemn the world, that the world might be saved through him. We Christians not just Methodists, we Christians do a bad job at remembering that. We're so busy condemning the world that we forget to seek and to save, like Jesus did, the lost. Some of those, some of you that have taken religion courses or even history courses know the most bloodiest wars that have ever been fought are religious wars. I wish I could say all those knights going to the Holy Lands known as the Crusaders, they reaped an awful lot of death to a lot of people. You wonder why the church isn't growing today? It's not because it's not having enough programs. Because we've lost a generation and we will continue to lose a generation that has gone through the hard stuff of divorce. And when they see churches fight, it reminds them of the fights that their mom and dad had before they broke up. I was 12 years of age and we'd been going to this non-denominational church in Pennsylvania. Back then they had, in this church, they had boys going to one class and girls going to another. And my Sunday school teacher was kind of good because what Sunday school teacher did I think of in the fall would tell all the kids, get your BB guns and we're going to my farm and we're going to shoot BB guns and a muzzle loader. Wow. But I didn't have a BB gun. Never had one. I'm nine or ten years of age. I should have had one. But I didn't, but dad was able to find one, a second-hand one. It still shot well. In the church, they had a group of elders or deacons. I don't remember what they officially called them, but they asked one of the elders or slash deacons to come down and off the elected office because his son has gotten in trouble, and they were taking the biblical passage that a father needs to have control of his house to be a leader in the church. I didn't any, know anything like that. And then the preacher sided with this elder, which I thought was interesting, and pretty soon they turned on him. A man that preached the word of God. And that I mean, you'd sit there in the pew, most of the congregation would have their Bibles open and They'd have their pens out and they'd be marking in the margins or in the back of the Bible in the notes section. That hurt. But on top of that, that same year, I was going with my dad hunting with an actual gun. The next year he got orders to go to Korea for 18 months. They called those a hardship tour and you know what happens to a young man going from 12 to 13, 14? It's rough. And so now God had me mad at him, and the federal government had me mad at them. And so when the Vietnam War broke out, you could find little Johnny in those different kinds of protest tests. Never burnt a draft card. 
But I was kind of like someone who had no one to go to. No God, no country. The hurt, the pain. Now, even though I didn't want to go to church, back in those days, Dad would say, whether you like it or not, if you're going to put your feet under my table, you're going to church. And so I did. Went to this one church for about three years. And one November, during a missionary conference of missionaries that had come out of that church, some missionaries in the country and some foreign missionaries, and my friends were going, and you know, I had to go. Sitting up in the balcony, and about Wednesday of that week, my friend said to me, John, you know this gir- these girls that have been sitting up here? I said, yeah. Well, I'm going to have a date with the one on Friday if you will date the other one. But there's only one catch, John. They want us to walk down the aisle. I said, I don't care how pretty a girl is. I'm not walking down no aisle to give my life to Jesus. But he did. Neither he had more faith in God than I did because it wasn't until Friday that I felt God calling upon my life to trust him enough. Trust him and not to trust the people. Back then, churches were packed. And as I was walking down that aisle, the next call I got was I want you to preach for me and to serve my church. I didn't know it was going to be a Methodist church. And when I got there next to the pew where mom and dad were sitting and I got that call, call, I stopped and I just broke out laughing. Mom cut her eyes at me like moms do. (laughs) Get a hold of yourself, Johnny. When I got down there, the preacher said, you're not only accepting Christ as your Lord and Savior, but you've experienced his unconditional love. That no matter how mad you got at him, he still loved you along the way. We talked about my call. I said, I don't know why God wants me because I was already prepared to get a commission to West Point to be a career army officer. Vietnam was going on and everybody who went to service wanted to get what they called as their combat infantry badge. And the only way you could do that was to be so many months in actual combat. And there hadn't been combat for a long time. And so a lot of young officers and a lot of young soldiers were wanting that badge. And then I went to a Bible college where this preacher had gone to and studied the Bible. And more importantly than that, every Monday morning we had to say how many people we witnessed to, where we went to church, our third and fourth year of school. We had to be teaching Sunday school, our youth, or or doing something and give an account. I didn't really like that, but I did it. And now today, I look at churches across this area. I'm not even looking at the whole state, but when when I was able to drive from church to church to go preach, I don't see that many cars in anybody's parking lots anymore, regardless if they're a small country church or a Methodist or Baptist church. Because I'm afraid. People have been too cruel to one another. Now, what do you mean, John? When I first came on the district, (laughs) I went to two or three churches on Sunday to visit. 
I don't know if this has happened to you. It's happened in both a small church and a large church, but I will say it hasn't happened to me when I first came to Ringgold Methodist Church. I would get to church early and I'd go sit in the pew and usually sit in the back until this event happened and then I started getting to church late. Because I sat down, I was preparing myself because of the week that a DS has. Someone came up to me and said, you're in my pew. And we wonder why we don't have people. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. What do you give for your love to God and for your love of the world? Is it seeing somebody sit in your pew and say, hey, I'm so-and-so and I usually sit there. Can I sit with you? And by the way, my husband and grandkids will be coming too. Has that ever happened to anyone? I hope I can do a better job when I'm sitting in the pew of after seeing things to let people know that you're in the house of God and God loves you. Do you believe in him? Have you put your whole trust in him and the old word that I know, been born again? He came for you because he loved you so much. He came that he might love and glorify and give you eternal life. And if you don't know this Jesus, I believe he's made himself plain to you because he's brought you here. But if you need more information, check with one of his disciples. Check with one of his witnesses. Oh, there is our problem. We are to witness for Christ. If not by word, but by deed. And when things go rough at the workplace, do the workers know that you are a disciple of Jesus Christ? And if so, do they see how you work under hard times and distress? And then say, tell me what keeps you going. After all, he came to you. Well, perhaps you already believe and trust in him. Then like I've been saying, follow his example of love. Go into this world, not to condemn it, but to save it. Live your life so that others might see God's love in you. And be saved through Christ because you are walking the walk and talking the talk. If God so loved the world that he sacrificed his life for us, shouldn't we love enough? Shouldn't we make enough sacrifices to show the world that he still has his disciples in this world? I heard long time ago, and you may have too, the Christian faith is just one generation from extinction. It shouldn't worry you so much that your numbers may be down, but it bothers me. Even during the pandemic, I was coming out of the office in Dalton Somebody was walking on the street and someone said, do you work in there? And I said, yes, sir, I do. He said, you want to know why I gave up on God in the church? I said, why, sir? He said, I believe there are over 45,000, might be more, Protestant denominations. I said, you may be correct. He said, sir, my, my point is, they all say that Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior. Who has it right? I said, what do you mean? He said, by their actions, 
even in their own denominations, like yours. They're not showing that they love God with all their heart, soul, and mind and their neighbor like themselves. Your churches in this country seem almost like the home I grew up in. Mom and dad fussing and fighting and, and ending in a marriage and then mom gets custody of me and then a second stepdad. And then stepdad gets custody of me and then I get a stepmother. My friends, that broke my heart. This person was no more than 25 years of age. And we're wondering where the young people are. They're out there. It's the church that's let them down. It's the church that's not showing them that there's a place that they can come to heal their broken wounds. Of having support groups for children of divorced parents. Classes for couples to keep them together in marriage and marriage retreats. I know your pastor here does those different things. That's why I'm blessed to be with you today. And for those of you that are watching or listening, this church and these members are trying awful hard to so love the world. And sometimes... The first person that you have to love is you. How can you love somebody else if you cannot really believe and trust that God loves you no matter what? I believe that's my word from God to you today. There's nothing that you have done that God would not have died for to bring you into that saving relationship with him right now. And if you are listening or watching and God brought you and you don't know why you got that channel tuned in on Facebook or whatever social media means, give this church a call or send them a text or email and let them know that you want to know more. That you need that Jesus. That son of God that was sent to this earth for you. To make you whole. And to heal a nation. Amen.